I am deeply jealous, as always, of uh, I, I have here my my cup of tea <laughs> while you're enjoying or about to enjoy some what should be wonderful wines. Um, some of you were present at a dinner that we did four or five years ago when we looked at Volnay's from uh, the Marquis d'Angeville, Comte Lafont and Michel Lafarge. And I think everybody who was there uh, came away with a really positive view of the best of Volnay. And in fact, it's a shame that we didn't have at that point any Pustors to go as well, because in its heyday, Pustor is right up there alongside D'Angeville and Lafarge as one of the absolute greats. Um, I mean, the antecedents are pretty good, because in the late 19th century, it belonged to a chap called Jacques-Marie duveau Blochet, And duveau Blochet is a name that will be familiar to most of you, because, of course, he also owned uh, Domaine de la Romani Conti. And there is that premier, Von Romani Premier Cru Cuvée, uh, which bears his name in some vintages from DRC. So um, subsequently, his uh, heirs didn't really do much with it. And uh, in due course, they sold up. Um, in the spring of uh, 1964 and later that year a really beautiful in fact a magnificent house uh, on the edge of Volnay uh, I mean it's it's the one building that stands out on the hillside when you're looking at Volnay from the plain uh, came on the market and so they got first of all the vineyards and then they got that house and together they made the Mendele Pustor. The reason it's called Pustor is because uh, part of the ownership of the vineyards is a monopoly, just over two hectares, called Claude La Boustor. And they would have called it Domaine de la Boustor, but um, interfering administrators at the time said, you're not allowed to have uh, the name of a um, domain the same as the name of a vineyard. Obviously not taking into account Domaine de la Romani Conti and one or two others, but uh, uh, that was the ruling. And, and so they changed uh, uh, the B for, for boost and a boost sort of means something like a little hummock in the ground uh, to a P for pus, which is um, uh, either a, a shoot or a, or a thumb, actually thumb is spelled differently, um, or indeed an inch. But uh, uh, anyway, to mend la pustor, it became. Now, um, the person who bought it was um, uh, an interesting man called um, Jean Ferté who was a member of all the sort of gastronomic uh, clubs in France, like the Club des Sons, of which uh, Jacques Sais of Domaine du Jacques' father was president. And um, anyway, Jean Ferté was a, a great lover of wine and food and uh, culture and all the rest of it. He was unmarried himself, um, <clears throat> but he had a niece who was getting friendly with and about to marry, a young man called Gérard Potel, and Ferté liked both of them, and so he installed them to run this new Domaine de la Pustor, as from 1964. And in fact, you haven't got a 64 tonight, but if ever you see it, you might even find it in big bottles, because Gérard Patel bottled a lot in um, double magnums and, and above. Um, and, uh, and 64, his first vintage, was a legend because he made some really powerful, age-worthy, long-lived uh, wines. Um, one of these imperials was uh, served at the wedding of my neighbours uh, Becky Wasserman and Russell Hone back on April Fool's Day in 1988 and um, very good it was then but still too young. Um, <clears throat> so um, one of the shareholders, because Jean Ferté didn't take the whole thing, was actually Domaine Dujac but a little bit later on when they uh, bought their own property, they didn't exist as Domaine Dujac but the Sos family of Dujac, when they bought their own property, um, after a while, it just made sense for them not to have too many eggs in too many different baskets, and they decided to sell up. And in due course, it took a while before it happened. But in 1985, various Australians came on board as shareholders. Um, so Gérard Patel really, everybody sat up and took notice. He was quite an iconoclastic sort of guy. He didn't do things the standard way. And he was also really good at encouraging the next younger generation. So if you talk to the Rumiers and Lafons and so on and so forth, they all owe a, um, quite a debt to um, <coughs> Gérard Patel, as does, in fact, um, Jacques Sais uh, of Domaine du Jacques, because Gérard was his, uh, one of his most important mentors. 
Having said which, uh, Jacques decided he was going to do everything with whole bunches and um, Gerard Patel was less in that way. He used to do a, mi a mixture of these stems and whole bunches, <clears throat> the proportion changing over a period. And uh, we may see that in evidence because tonight's wines run from 1979 to 1993. The last vintage that Gerard Patel made was 1996 because sadly he had a heart attack and, and died in early the following year. Um, so that's the sort of more general background. The domain today actually, uh, it's now owned by a man called Patrick Londanger, um, and his son has just sort of taken over managing it. So Londanger bought, bought it in 1997, uh, and he's bought other vineyards as well. So nowadays they have Bonmar, Claire de Roche, Corton Côte d'Ivoire, Corton Bresson, several vineyards in chambon musigny a little bit of Pudigny Caire, um, and uh, the original Pustor holdings, which are all in Volnay, apart from a bit of Pomar, Premier Cru, Jarolier, and, to, and a Sontenay vineyard, Clos which is actually one of my favorites. But we're gonna concentrate on the three key vineyards, which are the Caire regular, the Caire Clos des Soissons-Douvray, and the um, Clos de la Bustor. So the two Caires are at opposite ends of the Caire appellation. And as uh, I'm sure you've come across before, um, Caires got the special reputation as being the number one place to be in, um, in Volnay. Um, the Clos de la Bustor is at the top of the vineyard at the southern end. So it's adjacent to the road that continues um, above Merceau, past Montley, and then up the side valley. Um, and it's, it's, it's absolutely next to it. It's where Volnay turns into Merceau, is where the Clos de la Bustor is. Uh, and that is 2.39 hectares. Then at the northern end of the vineyard and lower down the slope is the regular Caire, next door to Bouchard's big holding. And there they've got 2.24 hectares. And finally, Clos de la Bustor, which they have in the monopoly and is close by the house, um, so it's just below the central part of the village itself is 2.13 hectares. So when you've got two hectares uh, or more of each of these, you can actually make a decent amount of wine. And it's much easier to make good wine when you've got a certain volume that can go with it. Um, of the vintages you've got, we've got 293s, which was a tricky vintage with lots of mildew, but has come out all right. You've then got one ninety ninety, and um, I believe that we have uh, one of you to thank for inserting alongside the Clos de Chêne from Michel Lafarge, just to see if Pustor can uh, stand in the same uh, in the same breath as Lafarge. And uh, I've tasted that Clos de Chêne three times recently. Once was corked, but the other two were absolutely spectacular. Um, then we go to two eighty eight. Um, a slightly more austere vintage, but still good. And an 86, which was a tricky year, but one in which um, Gerard Patel, uh, Pustor was thought to have done well for reasons we'll come to. After that, you've got the great classic of 85, the weird vintage of 83, which is either great or terrible, depending, um, depending on whether you manage to rot or not. And then 80 and 79, which are both nice vintages, short of the top class, but both vintages, which I think Volnay did rather well, um, better than most other villages. Um, so you are now being served the first, the 293s, I'm guessing. Yes? Who's got the talking thing? <laughs> yes. Yeah, okay. that's correct. Okay, well, <clears throat> while you taste those, I will uh, talk a little bit about what to expect between, so it's a Caire and the Clos des Soissons Douvre, uh, other bit of Caire. I think probably just put on your um, tasting sheets, it probably just says Clos des Soissons Douvre, but just to remind you, it is part of Caire. Um, <clears throat> and these two holdings together make uh, um, Pustor the largest holder of Caire, with Bouchard in second place. Um, so we've got a difference of where they are on the slope. Um, and I do expect there to be significantly more uh, meat and weight of fruit um, and perhaps quality as well in the Clodis Fossil Duvray. 
So what, uh, this may be the only pairing when you've got those two in the same vintage. I think that's right. I think otherwise it tends to be Claude Le Boustor. Um, 1993 was a vintage that could have been very good, but there was a, not very good weather early in the season and there was significant mildew pressure. And um, the thing about that is that you have to treat against the mildew with sulfur and or copper sprays, and that toughens up the skins. So you've got slightly harsh skins in 93, which has led to a bit of a firmness um, uh, in some of the wines. It was probably a greater vintage in the um, Cote de Nuit than the Cote de Bone, but the Cote de Bone, as so often, catches up with uh, extra aging. And I've mentioned this many times before, but the wines of Volnay, even though they're supposed to be lighter, do seem to age really well, and they build in quality and character with that aging. But it was a big mildew year. Um, I remember seeing a Robert Parker uh, vintage chart for all regions, and I had a look on the Burgundy bit, and the lowest score he gave to any vintage in any part of Burgundy was to 1993 reds from the Cote de Bone. Uh, 68 points out of 100 it got as an overall vintage summary. But we know better about Burgundy than Mr. Parker did. Um, and um, uh, it's nothing like as bad as that, um, even if it's obviously not going to be quite in the same class as 1990. I would expect these wines to be not quite ready yet, to have a slightly firm edge, um, but still to have some pretty good fruit as well. Um, anybody want to comment from the floor? Since I don't have the opportunity of being drinking them with, of drinking them with you. Do I have to press something? Okay. I think you're, uh, Jasper, I agree on your, um, I find the straight Kyra like slightly sweeter, tastes a bit more of sort of summer fruits where the, um, uh, where I find that meatiness comes through. I think the Kyra is drinking, I, I, that's drinking beautifully now. I absolutely love that. I, I, that's my favourite, to be honest, of the two. Uh, I think the other one's just a little bit, needs a bit more time. So you're preferring the Kyra to drink over the Claudius Lasson Dubray? At present, yeah. 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 But do you think the Claudius Lasson Dubray has got the potential to leapfrog over the regular Kyra? I think there's a, I think there's a bit more structure and uh, complexity on the palate in the longer term, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm assuming these wines are a little bit more on the, the drier, more austere side compared to the voluptuous uh, options in Burgundy. And that probably won't be the case all the way through. It does depend on the vintage. Um, anybody else want to comment while we're here before we move on? Uh, Jasper, just to... Uh, just a quick comment. The, the only thing I would say about uh, these wines is that, I mean, the acidity is really nice now, the balance of the fruit and the acidity. I would worry a little bit if you kept them for very much longer, whether the fruit would fade before, you know, it rounds out, as it were. So I, I personally think they're both delightful to drink now. Yes, yes. I don't, know. <clears throat> I don't think there, it's ever going to be a particularly rounded uh, vintage. But I think it's going to be, uh, um, yes, wines of, of um, charm isn't quite right, but uh, the fruit should be expressing itself pretty well. And it, you may be right that the structure will, uh, won't will fade before the fruit does. Uh, I don't think I have tasted either of those recently. I had a little look on my, on my uh, site and didn't... Uh, uh, didn't find 93s from Pustor. Uh, I don't think. Double check on that. Anyway, um, so we don't have the Claude Le Boustor to, to add to our comparison at this point. Um, but, but Jasper, we just got poured the Claude Le Boustor 1990 in Magnum. Ah, right. It is wonderful. Yes, well, that is the only wine that I've had really recently, and I didn't write it up because we had it for the first dinner next door after after Becky died um, with um, Russell and Becky's sons, Peter and Paul. And we came over and the, the wine that I brought was a magnum of the Claudius Fosson Duvray, um, uh, 1990. Um, incidentally, I, uh, sorry, Claudius Le Boustor, um, uh, 1990. Uh, I, I, I 
was uh, inaccurate there. I did taste uh, the Clos des 60 Ouvres in 1993, two years ago uh, in London, drank it over a 93 dinner. And I liked it a lot. Um, uh, boom, boom, boom. Um, I found a little slightly green note in it, which I personally don't mind, others may. Uh, and I thought it was a delicious wine that could be at its peak. So I'm very slightly revised what, I, what I've just said a few minutes ago. But on to the 1990, uh, and have you got the Lafarge alongside or just the Pustor for a moment? Uh, just the Pustor at the moment, but the Lafarge is on its way. On its way, exactly. Well, it'd be good to taste the Pustor on its own. And even better news, as you pointed out, it's in a magnum, so plenty more to come uh, over, over dinner tonight. So you have another seven wines over dinner, plus the two halves of the two magnums, plus anything left in the, in the bottles that uh, you're enjoying. I just think in 1990, he got things absolutely, totally right, really. Um, and it, sure, it, it is a very good vintage. At the time, not everybody liked it so much because some people felt the summer had been a little bit too hot, a little bit too warm. Um, but Patel always managed to get a sense of balance into his wines. The structure is always right. Um, so by this period, uh, what he was doing, um, uh, earlier on, he had only destemmed the young vines and kept the older vines. And by this period, uh, he was destemming a little bit more. Um, so the stem effect wouldn't have had a major influence, but there was a little bit there. Um, for what it's worth, um, th they're not particularly old vines. Um, the Close de la Bustor was planted in various stages, 58, 67, 70, 74, and then 91. So by the time of the 1990, you would have had, um, no, it was probably grubbed up that bit. So you probably had the plantings between 58 and 74. So they're 15 to 30 years old. And that's roughly the true of the Clos des Fossons d'Ouvre. The plantings are 54, 56, 82, 83, 87. Uh, so again, not especially old vines. And for the Carré, uh, it was three quarters planted in 1976 and one quarter planted in 1989, which would mean that um, when you get to the older vintages, they would have, they would have had an older planting. So Patel, um, being a perfectionist, replanted quite, uh, quite a lot of vineyard during his stewardship. Um, as I say, because it was sort of a, you know, a private family thing when we had that magnum of, of Bustor, I didn't write any notes on it on the evening. But gosh, it was good. It really was um, a cracking good bottle, which I felt was entirely ready to drink and capable of age aging for a lot, lot longer if one wanted it to. Just trying to shut off what's making noises on my screen so you don't get those. Um, and it sounds like it's going down well with you. I'm matching quite a deeper color than uh, the first two um, and probably slightly more youthful color going to make a difference depending on how much you, wine you've got in your glass, of course, the colour. Definitely a brighter colour. Yeah. Uh, 90 Bustor. Yeah, I mean, I think that will be, and I'm sure that's going to go on building through the evening. There's uh, no reason why it would not. So that's our first uh, look at the Bustor vineyard. So um, there's a little road that you'd take if you wanted to go up to the old De Monte house or the Lafarge house. And on the left, you've got the Bustor building. And on the right, you've got um, a vineyard called uh, Claude de la Chapelle. And then next to it, you have Claude de la Bustor. And um, uh, just below that, um, or below Claude de la Chapelle, uh, you've got the Claude de Versailles of the young uh, Thibaut Clerge, who's starting to make um, a bit of a noise. Uh, so Bustor would be uh, also immediately underneath Lafarge's Claude du Chateau des Ducs. Very, very central. And we first hear mention of this vineyard as long ago as 1272 before even Clive Coates was born. Uh, 
So, um, there's nothing especially remarkable about the soil of Claude Le Bustor, um, but obviously being surrounded by the walls that makes it a clo gives you a slightly warmer microclimate and it's sort of an east and southeast facing slope. So it's in a pretty good place. <laughs> and the first course arrives, go with it. Do you now also have, it looks as though you've got a fourth glass, so it looks as though you have Michel Lafarge, Volnay, Claude Chen, which also looks to be a pretty dark color. Um, so let me check out my notes on uh, uh, on that, but I remember that that the two occasions when I had a, a clean and healthy bottle, it was definitely a um, a five star uh, rating, I think, a 96 pointer for me, which is um, pretty exciting. I'm hearing some mutters. Do, do you have a doubt about it? Uh, it's, it's not right. It's, uh, Less than perfect bottle. I was a bit worried about how dark it appeared to be in your in your glasses because um, you know I wouldn't I wouldn't expect it to. Uh, um, I mean, it, it's not a domain that makes sort of famously dark coloured uh, wines, so it, it's a little worrying. That I must admit. Do you think it's a bit oxidised or or cork or a mixture of the two? Yeah. Yeah, he's not normally a, a, you know, a major. Um, so my two, my two positive notes read apart from the um, the court bottle I have one was dense, powerful color, rich, deep fruit. Black notes, lovely depth of fruit, tannins, just enough acidity, powerful, very concentrated. An extra degree of richness here, which almost hides the Volnay character until the aftertaste when pure Volnay resurfaces. That was November 2015. So that was the dinner in Hong Kong, I think, unless it was October 2017. Um, actually, that might be the Hong Kong bottle. Rich, bright color, sensational, power laden nose, all the class and elegance you'd hope for, but with concentration as well. From start to finish, this wine had an immaculate sense of precision. Time in the glass seemed to refine the wine further rather than causing it to deepen. It didn't need to. Brilliant Volnay approaching the height of its powers. I think that's probably the bottle that we, uh, uh, I think the November 15 note was part of a vertical tasting and the October 2017 was when I was in Hong Kong and we had dinner together. Um, so, I, you know, it, it does sound as though you've got a, a, a funky and faulty bottle, alas. <laughs> I'll be interesting as to that it's set, that it's set, yes, you're probably so. It's only time to think that the value of the game. Yeah. He's been chilling the bottle, so maybe chilling it. Um, I'll just wait. I mean, for the sound of it, probably um, just um, keep what's left and uh, come back to it later on and just see if it does emerge, yeah. take off whatever it's got. But, you know, you can have a low level of cork taint that throws it off course without being really obviously DTA. And you can have a cork which is let in a little bit more oxygen than it should. In the meantime, we can take the booster off, which is very good. Wait, wait, it's a backup. Yes, it is. So, we can walk. Yes, we can. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're covered. Oh, please. <laughs> hey, Jasper, just curious. Yeah. Michel Lafarge, not bottle the Soda Shen or the Go to Chateau de Duke in Magnum, right? Does he? Yeah. Um, probably on demand. You don't see a lot of Magnums around, but uh, but yes. It, um, in that period, there was sort of less of a demand for, for Magnums. Um, I'm just trying to think. I think even when we've done domains with verticals with a domain, I think it's been bottles that they provided rather than Magnums. Um, so I think on the whole, more bottles and magnums, yes. 
Jasper, back in 90, would, would Lafarge, um, when bottling, would they bottle direct from barrel to um, barrel to bottle, or would they prefer, would, would they? No, would I, they I don't think so. Uh, partly because their barrel cellar, um, you'll have been down in it, I should think, Adam. Uh, it's yeah. a tiny little cellar, particularly where they put that wine. It's a tiny little cellar at the back. You wouldn't have any room for any bottling equipment, so they would have dragged the barrel. They would, I'm sure, they would have uh, even back then. They would have harmonized in a tank and bottled from tank. Um, I'll verify that with them, but I would have thought so. What a bummer, as we say, because that should have been a, a highlight. But uh, so at the moment, the 1990 Claude Labouste reigns supreme. Sorry, Michael, I missed that. Just means that we have to do this again via Zoom. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. What, once a week until you run out of bottles. <laughs> it does feel like once a week at home. Yeah. <laughs> it has been. But it has, it has been, been, but been. not not always not always Volne, but uh, um <laughs> yeah. No, I think I think uh, it would be well worth gathering thing, things together so we can actually have uh, a, a four-way evening between Dongeville. Uh, Lafarge, Bustor, and Lafont. Um, yeah. Oh, great. Noted. Yeah. 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 Okay. Next week. But, but you, you, uh, you, have to wait, you have to wait till I can get there for that one. Yeah. Can't let you guys have all the fun. Um, not until we find a way that you can, you can pour the wine down the ether and we get the wine at the other end in the same condition. Uh, <laughs> the way to go. Ask a question. You've always yeah. said and Chambol have similarities. So should we do a Chambol Volnay tasting? Oh, okay. Uh, and then a Pomar Chevre tasting. Uh, I think someone's changed the camera, so I can only see a couple of you now rather than the whole room. Um, but uh, I mean, maybe maybe an improvement, of course, only being able to see the first two. <laughs> Oh yeah, you, you, you could always show me a blank wall instead and when your cheerful yeah. faces around the room. Um, anyway, um, it would be interesting to do that, I think with relatively mature wines, just mix them around, uh, you do it one evening, get people to come along and everybody brings either one of each or, and then the sommelier serves them in a completely random order and to see what you make of it. All right. That was a great one. Jasper, yeah. Jasper, yeah. Jasper, you never would have picked it like that. You were you were saying earlier that if uh, Gerard wasn't the biggest fan of using stems. What what in the wines that we've tasted so far in this sort of era, do you have any sort of idea on how much how much how, how much stems they'd be using? No, I, I I don't I don't know exactly because in those days people weren't really asking those sorts of questions. We everybody would just come and taste the wine and say, is it good wine or not good wine? And we were much less geeky than we now are, uh, wanting to know exactly how it's done. Uh, so I don't know, but I, what I do know is that in the earlier period, it was only the young vines that got um, these stems, and later on he 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 reduced the amount of stems. He did have an interesting technique, um, uh, incidentally, which is that um, while using quite a lot of stems, he found that if you keep the stems <clears throat> in the wine during all the vinification, you tend to end up with quite a light colour as in the Dujac wines of that period. So what he started to do uh, was to heat up the vat very early on, right at the start of fermentation. So he got a lot of color and it got fixed and then didn't get leached out later on. And after that, he would cool it down to, uh, so he'd heat up to 35 degrees and then cool back down to 25, um, which is something that Father Lafont, René Lafont also did in years in which he thought the um, skins weren't very healthy. Uh, he, he would heat up a lot to uh, uh, right, at, right at the start. Um, but it's true that the Pustor wines always had good colour and the Jacques Seyss du Jacques wines were always much lighter in colour. Um, good. So, um, so Pustor, I think, is typically a wine compared to Claude des Vassandouvre, which is a little bit more solid in its body, uh, but perhaps doesn't hit quite the same heights of sort of quality of fragrance. 
And um, I was checking back through various um, uh, authors, Matt Kramer, Clive Coates, and so on. And they both say that it would depend on the vintage, whether they preferred the Clos des Fossons d'Ouvre or the Clos de la Boustor. Um, but the inference being, and I would go along with this, that either of those is typically better than the Caire. And there is a fourth Volnay Premier Cru that the domain has, which is also a monopoly, called the Clos d'Odignac, um, which is right next door. It's, um, uh, it's directly in front of the building itself. And though it's nice wine, it is clearly not the equal of any of the others. Actually, it's on a slope which faces a little bit more north than anything else. Okay, coming up, we have a pair of 88s. Are they coming around now? Looks like it. So 88 is a vintage which found a lot of favor in the UK and much less in America. Um, in the UK, we liked it because it had uh, a fair amount of concentration, but austere rather than plump. And in the States, they disliked it for the same reason, <laughs> the austerity and not the succulence. Um, the grapes appeared to ripen in the sense that they got to 12.5% on their own, which in those days was still very rare. Uh, the majority of vintages would be chapterized. And so once you got to 12.5% in sort of mid-September, everybody was really excited and decided to harvest. But the grapes themselves um, weren't ripe. They had the sugar, but they weren't ripe. Uh, and uh, I remember people telling me that it was really quite difficult to uh, get the bunches off the vine. They didn't want to, uh, want to come. So the stems and the pips and the skins hadn't fully ripened, which is where the austerity comes in. Now, whether the English or the Americans were right in their assumptions uh, isn't really provable because the English still quite like the vintage and the Americans still don't especially like the vintage. Apologies to um, the English and Americans amongst you. And, uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very sort of glib general point, um, but it has, has some bearing. And you've got here, you've got the Carré and the Bustor side by side, but the Bustor again having the um, benefit of being a magnum. Um, so it'll be interesting if you taste them. I'm expecting something with slightly higher acidity, um, maybe some more tannins, uh, pretty decent concentration of fruit. It won't be entirely unlike the 93, but I don't know where it will have got to in the stage of um, maturity. So I haven't seen it for a while. I, I look forward to your commentary. What was that, Adam? Yeah. The, the, the acid, the 88, the 80, what we thought about the 93 with that acid being quite high, in the 88, you do get that high level of acid on the palate. It's still, it's yeah. absolutely, still absolutely lovely. The nose is gorgeous, but that acid is, is, is quite high. It's quite, sort of, quite striking. A little, a little bit too high to, for, for ideal be, pleasure. It's going to be massively critical. Yeah. Um, all my notes on 88 Volnais, there's one for Lafon, and the rest are all um, uh, Lafarge, uh, including loving the Clos de Chien 88. Um, uh, so, yes, no, I haven't seen a, 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 a Pustor 88 in, in quite a while. Uh, so, I don't have anything up to date to bring to that. So, I need to come to Hong Kong so I can get to taste these wines with you. The Magnum of 1988 is called uh, uh, the 88 Magnum. That is a bummer. Don't oh, worry, we have a backup. Oh. Another Magnum of 88. Sadly, it's only a half bottle. <laughs> 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 Who's pouring that? <laughs> so, so that means that so Michael is going to get the backup, and there may not be enough for anyone else. Is that what we're saying? <laughs> when you find, when you find <laughs> Gerard Hotel's wine, you take whatever you can get. <laughs> so we have. Uh, what is it, Scott? Actually, I don't know what your thoughts are on this, but um, uh, one option, uh, uh, those of you who uh, have a Coravin, is to check the bottles before they come to the venue. Just yes. take the tiniest bit out to so that then you know if it's corked and you can replace it with something else. 
think that's the fear that we all that we all face as our sellers is 10 percent growth. Cool. Uh, we have a we have a half bottle yeah. of Rolex <laughs> Sauvignon <laughs> 1990. Which vintage, Michael? I it faded out at the end. 1990. 1990. Wow. So, are you going to do that now? Or will you do that later? Um, we've okay, just we yeah. just served the Claudia Soisson Ouvre 86. Right. Okay. So this is a vintage. This is a vintage that um, I think I think I uh, it was Clive Coates singled out that um, Gerard Patel's uh, habit of um, giving the uh, wines uh, a bit of heat treatment at the start worked really well. And 86 was a year that um, it was beautiful weather at the start of the harvest. The whites came in in pretty good condition. The very first reds came in in decent condition. But after that, it rained more or less steadily during the harvest. And yeah. the wines got less and less good as you went on. Which is why, weirdly enough, if you, um, the 86 Echezo from DRC is particularly good within the DRC range in that year because it was the one vineyard that got picked before the rain. And some of us remember drinking it at the chairman's house in Shanghai. Do we not, Nick, Michael? It was wonderful. <laughs> it was good, yes. Um, so here we've got the Claudia Soisson Duvre, and I would love to know how that's showing um, because it is really a minor vintage. Um, your screen, you are now disappearing. I can just see one person's foot and even yeah. that is disappearing from view. Yeah. We're sliding away. <laughs> that's not so tall. But maybe you were hinting that it was tight. You have to stay there when I stop. <laughs> I'll be leaving you to your your food and drink fairly soon. Um, yeah, so uh, how is the 86? So it's a vintage which, if that's showing well, then it's a bonus. If it's a bit iffy, then that's probably part of the course. Nose is, nose is lovely. Okay. Yeah, it's really good Very good average. Good, good. Well, that's, that's, that's a, a, a score for Gerard Patel. Who was a great guy. He was. He, I mean, he had lots of opinions. He was sometimes a little bit uncomfortable to be with. And it didn't suffer fools gladly, and uh, uh, and you know, expected people to be able to taste the wines properly rather than being told what they were like. And the sort of person who might easily deliberately serve somebody a faulty wine to see if they could spot it. Um, you guys have passed that tonight. You've uh, spotted the deliberately caught magnum. <laughs> I'd say that it's, it's, there's just a message of truth there, but it's past its best, but it's not bad. Yeah, yeah, and a, a nice agreeable sort of mid midweek lunch wine, but not a, not a special occasion wine now. No, I think, you know, that's what, 40, 35 years old for uh, a rainy vintage. Um, I think that sounds as though he, they've done well. Right, well, look, um, I think the, the view was that uh, um, I would uh, leave you to enjoy the remaining vintages, just to say a few words about them. Obviously, they're all Pustor and they're with the three vineyards that we've already looked at. 85 should be utterly gorgeous now, really in a beautiful place. Um, probably fully ready, but probably also capable of lasting a while longer. 83, I have absolutely no idea uh, this was a year in which there was a significant amount of rot, which actually developed early and then dried in the vineyards. Uh, and in those days, the majority of people, including some quite famous uh, domains, would have just sort of shrugged and said, well, you know, that's, those are the grapes we've got this year. And they would have shoved them all into the fermenting uh, vats. And uh, uh, as a result, quite a few um, wines uh, came out um really really ruined by rot but a few other people did really well so we know that de monte did extremely well um in this vintage uh so um lafon's 83s when i've tried them have not been good lafages have been okay uh so yeah um we will have to wait and see i don't think i've got anything much on my um website from 83 Volney, I can't immediately remember um, drinking one in the near past. 
I had a Claude Chêne from Lafarge in November 2015, um, which is very good, but the tannins are, are quite aggressive and a little bit drying. And that I think is uh, a residue of the uh, rot showing itself. So uh, that would be really interesting to see. And then uh, um, Michael, Scott, whoever, any of you, please report back, I'd love to know. Um, and then there's uh, 1980 and 79. So 80 was a year in which Louis Latour, as a spokesman for the Burgundy wine industry, stood up at an event in New York and said, the wines in 1980 are completely filthy and I don't recommend you to buy any of them. Uh, and it's true that very few negotiants managed to make decent 1980s, but lots of individual growers did. And I like this vintage, uh, a very pure fruit, not hugely ripe, um, not a massive concentration or great length, but just really nice wines. Uh, which I'd expect to be fully mature by now. Uh, and then finally, 1979, I think fairly consistently, vintages ending in nine seem to have done even better in Volnay than in the rest of Burgundy. 79, 89, 99 uh, in particular, uh, were years in which Volnay just did wonderfully well. So I hope that you'll have a, a gorgeous wine to finish off with. Um, I'm happy to stay with you for a while. It's entirely um, what you would like, but I think it's probably more relaxing for you after a while to just be able to sit and chat and drink the wines and eat the food and enjoy. But do you have any, any more thoughts or questions you'd like to raise what we've done so far or what's coming up? Mr. Bilby, can you show your paddle number, please? Uh, so um, in Volnay now, are there any uh, uh, winemakers that you feel are really doing, you know, that golden era in the 80s where you had, you know, the, the, the names we mentioned, taking them aside, are there any young winemakers today that you feel are really the leading light setting the example? Um, uh, there are actually a lot who are, if not quite in the same category that you've mentioned, are well worth looking at because some of them have only got a tiny tweak to move up to uh, one higher category. So uh, you've got uh, Thibaut Clerget I mentioned where the domain is mostly Volnay and Vineyards, but uh, he does the winemaking in Pomar in his great uncle's cellar. Uh, you have got two branches of the Glontenay family, uh, B and T Glontenay and Georges Glontenay. Um, there is a young man called Florian Rossignol, who may be known to you because he is working or has been working in Hong Kong. Uh, and he and his brother, well, more his brother, uh, are taking over at that particular Rossignol, which is Rossignol Cornu, I think, domain. Um, they will need to make some strides, I think, to get it up to uh, a higher level, but uh, that could easily happen. Um, is there anybody else who I have missed out? Um, those are certainly a, a, a few ideas um, for, for Volnay. So both Volnay and Pomar, there's, there's a good sense of energy at the moment and uh, more names coming forward. Oh yes, two others, of course. Um, Domain Jean-Marc and Thomas Boulet, who have pretty much arrived and some people, um, William Kelly is a great fan, but that's partly because Boulet is doing the high pruning thing, which uh, William is very keen on. Um, and I'm a fan, but not to the, quite the same degree. Uh, but he's um, getting a lot of recognition in Volnay. And his cousin, Pierrick uh, Boulet, also known as Domaine Pascal and Rayan Boulet, uh, I think are very good too. So plenty of choice. But I'm still gonna have Michel Lafarge as my number one. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Pustor nowadays are playing around with amphora, um, vinif not vinification, amphora maturation. So there are three, three of their vineyards, um, Caire, uh, Pustor, and I think Odignac, um, they make both in barrel and in amphora, and you can, and, and then bottle them separately. So you can buy either and, uh, and have a fun comparison something for a, one of your pairs evenings to try the same wine and the two different um, sort of things. I found I could tell the difference when I, because instead of them putting them out for me and telling me what they were, I asked if I could taste them blind. Um, and I, uh, I 
typically slightly preferred the Amphora, particularly in the first vintage I did it, 2018, uh, but I was able to, to, to tell the difference. Right, um, you have second halves of Magnums and you have full bottles of other wines to come and a half bottle. Um, shall I leave you in peace or does anybody else like to ask a question? Jasper, is, is Kyrie the truly greatest vineyard in Gold Um I think the gap has been narrowed by Claude Chen and Taipier, which perhaps in centuries gone by were a little bit cool being near the top of the hill. Uh, there's a certain Marquis d'Angeville who would uh, uh, recommend that Claude Duke as being right up there. Um, uh, but Probably of the probably Kyra still just about holds its head above the others. Um, I don't think it's declined, but the others are coming up to meet it. And I'm rather fond of Sontenay as well, even though it's not quite in Volney, it's labeled as Volney. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I will fade away. Uh, you. And enjoy the rest of your meal. Come and see us in Burgundy. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah.